Good morning and welcome. Welcome to Mount Airy Presbyterian Church. Good to see all of you here. Good to have those of you joining us online. And uh, we are here to worship the Lord today. And uh, we are uh, very grateful that we can do that. I'd like to welcome Abigail and her entourage of college students, RUF. We're running a toxic level of college students today. <laughs> It's very nice, yeah. Also happy to see Brooke in the house. Welcome, Brooke, along with Cricket. So, yeah. so uh, we'll uh, call the praise team up, and uh, let's start off with a call to worship. Our call to worship is from Psalm 150. Praise the Lord. Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And we do have a pipe today, so that's great. We'll sing uh, two praise songs. Let's stand to sing. Come people of the risen King and Lamb of God.
Lord God and Holy Father, we praise you, Lord. We praise you in your sanctuary. We praise you in your mighty heavens. We praise you for your mighty deeds. We praise you according to your excellent greatness. Lord, with a trumpet sound, we praise you and we uh, come before you and we just lift you up. Lord, you have shown yourself to us. You have opened up the uh, understanding through your word, how great you are. You know the hairs on our head. You understand the intimate details of our bodies and our minds. Not in a general way, Lord, but in a very specific way, in a personal way. Yet you are the creator of all the heavens and the earth. We just praise you now for how great you are. We praise you that you have made a way for establishing a personal relationship with us through the blood of Jesus. How great you are. We praise you. Holy Father. Amen. You may be seated. Our Old Testament reading today will be a responsive reading. Uh, God made a covenant of circumcision with Abraham, promising to make him a great nation and give him the land of Canaan. This is uh, a follow-up to uh, the establishment of that covenant. Let's read responsively. And the Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mambri, and he sat at the door of his tent, in the day, in the heat of the day. When he saw them, he ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves and after that you may pass on since you have come to your servant. So they said, do as you have said. And Abraham went quickly into the tent to Sarah and said, quick, three seeds of fine flour, knead it and make cakes. And he took curds and milk and the calf that he had prepared and set it before them. And he stood by them under the tree while they ate. Let's uh, sing a hymn of adoration. O oh, worship the king. Hymn number two. Song number two in the red hymnal. Verses one through four. Let's stand and sing.
Thank you. Please be seated. Our call to confession today comes from Psalm 53, verse two, verses 2 and 3. God looks down from the heaven on the children of man to see if there are any who understand, who seek after God. They have all fallen away. Together they have become corrupt. There is none who does good, not even one. Let's come before the Lord now for a time of uh, confession and prayer. Um, I will start us off and then we'll uh, leave a few minutes of silence at the end for you to confess uh, individually. Let's pray. Holy God, you have laid bare our sinful nature through your word. You have shown us that we are broken and we are corrupt. We don't naturally seek you. We don't naturally want to know you. We, not are, we are not inclined to go after you. Yet the very opposite, Lord, we are inclined to flee from you and to uh, make idols, make ourselves God. Lord, we are incapable of doing any good. We come before you now Father, and we humble ourselves. We know that by your grace and your mercy, you have made a way. And that way is through the sacrifice of your son Jesus, who paid the debt that we owe. And now, Lord, we can put on robes of righteousness because of the work of Christ. And you can see us as righteous because of the work of Christ. We praise you for that. Lord, we pray now that you would fill us with your spirit, that you would bring our hearts to repentance, that you would convict us of our sins, and that we would uh, come before you now in repentance as we spend a, a few moments of individual confession. Father, thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for making a way. Through the work of Jesus, in his name we pray. Amen. Let's uh, sing a hymn of assurance. O oh, Jesus, we adore thee. Number 255 in the red hymnal. Let's stand and sing. 255.
Our New Testament scripture reading today is from Acts, Acts 15, verses 1 through 11. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversations of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they had come to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. And the apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you, that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made, them no, and he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus, just as they will. Amen. Um, at this time, children ages three through six can attend children's Bible time. And we will enter a time of prayer, of thanksgiving and intercession. Let's come before the Lord. Lord God, our gracious and merciful Father, you have blessed us in so many ways with so many gifts, and we come now to thank you for those gifts. We thank you for the many material blessings you have laid before us and uh, the abundant spiritual blessing that you have given us uh, through the redeeming work of Jesus. Father, we pray that you would give us hearts that are generous and open. We pray that you would give us hearts of gratitude, that we would more deeply understand the way that you have blessed us, the way that you have kept us, the way that you walk with us day by day, minute by minute. Father, we ask now that you would show mercy to those of our families who do not know you. We ask that you would open their hearts, that they would see their sin, and that they would run to you um, in repentance and come into your kingdom. Father, we pray for this body. We ask that you would bless us as we seek to serve one another. We ask that you would give wisdom to our session and diaconate to the church staff and that you would uh, be with them as they work to support and sustain this body of believers. Father, we ask for your blessing on our government, our federal, state, and local governments, that they would make decisions that would be in accordance with your will and, and your word. We uh, pray that you would bring relief to the wars that are going on uh, now in, uh, in the Ukraine and in Israel. We pray, Father, that you would bring an end to those and that you would bring peace uh, into those situations. And Father, we just uh, are uh, so grateful to you that, uh, that you have given us in this country the freedom to worship you uh, without any uh, bonds or, or shackles on us. Father, we pray now for, uh, particularly for our youth group, we ask that the students would continue to grow in their faith and learn how to apply their faith in everyday life 
We ask that you bring more members into the youth group. Lord, we thank you for the college students of this body, and we thank you for the way that you have blessed them and kept them, and ask that you would continue to bless them in their studies. Father, we uh, have many uh, in our body that have ongoing health concerns. We would lay them before you now. Father, we know that you are the great physician. Lord, you are sovereign in all your ways, and we ask now for your mercy on uh, Sharon and on Artis, on Tom, on Joe and Diane, on Brooke and Artis and Lynn. Lord, bring healing, bring peace, bring strength as they depend on you. Father, we pray also for relatives of our body, for Joe's daughter-in-law, Laura, for Cindy's parents and Maxine's sister, Karen, for Steve's parents, Ed and Carrie, and for Mary Sue's grandson, Andrew. Lord, we also would pray for Butch and Marcia's son, David. Father, here we ask that you would bring uh, healing and that you would bring uh, your peace to those that are suffering. Lord, we uh, also bring before you um, Maxine's surgery that has been delayed. We ask that you would keep her healthy as she awaits uh, that surgery, and we pray that it would be successful. And Lord, we pray for uh, Mary Sue's granddaughter, Maria, with acute leukemia. We ask that you would give wisdom to the doctors as they decide the kind of treatment to provide her. And we pray for Maria's two young daughters and for the whole family, that you would wrap your loving arms around them and that they, that they would feel your peace and be comforted. Lord, we want to also uh, come before you now and give you praise for our new pastor, Sam and his family, as they begin making the transition from their church to ours. We thank you so much for the way that you have provided and we ask, Father, that you would work in this body, that we would support Sam, that we would prepare the way for him as, as they come here and that you would uh, bless his ministry among us. Father, you have uh, given us the opportunity to support many missionaries around the world. We pray for them now and ask that you would walk beside them and cause them to be productive. We pray particularly now for Craig and Ree in Japan. We ask um, that uh, Holy Spirit that you would come upon them and illuminate the hearts of the women in Ree's evangelistic Bible study. And uh, we ask that you would help Craig to prioritize the things that he has to do as he has many, uh, many new responsibilities. We ask, Lord, that many attending the church there would become involved in their small groups. And Father, we ask that the church would have a better understanding of the gifts that they've been given and would find ways to use those gifts there in Japan. Lord, we are just uh, so grateful to you for the way that you bless us. We uh, are so thankful to you for your love to us, uh, love that never fails. Uh, we fail often, but you never fail, and we thank you for that now. We pray these things in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. At this time, we have the opportunity to uh, worship the Lord through the giving of tithes and offerings. And we'll be ministered to by grace notes while we do that.
Let's stand for the doxology. back to you now a little bit of what you have entrusted to us use it use it to bless the work of building your kingdom and bringing you glory in the name of Jesus amen thank you well good morning everyone Good to see all of you here this morning, and I uh, want to welcome you in the name of our risen Savior, Jesus. I was going to ask you to turn in your Bibles, if you would, but there's uh, no place that you can turn. Let me see if I get this uh, in your Bible to find what I'm going to read to you this morning as our text, uh, because I was, like, I'll be explaining to you it's a compilation, uh, but uh, get your uh, bulletins out you had to have it printed there so if you would do that now and let me pray for us father thank you for the word that you've given to us thank you father that it is a living word and that it speaks to us uh, today the same as it would have spoken to those who lived at the time these words were originally penned in Jesus name we ask these things amen Because of the constraints of time, we're actually going to be uh, jumping um, ahead by about two years in this uh, survey that I've been trying to provide for you of the life of Jesus, the life of our Christ. Um, so we've skipped over those. The event we're going to be looking at this morning is covered in all three of the Synoptic Gospels. And... Uh, in case that's a term you're not familiar with, uh, that means Matthew, Mark, and Luke. We call them the synoptic gospels because they tend to cover the same material, roughly speaking. So this, is, uh, this event is covered in all three of them. They all felt it was important enough to include. And so what I've done is I've taken as our text this morning, a, uh, and I've compiled these uh, three readings into one. Um, I haven't left anything out. Um, I haven't repeated things that each author repeats, and uh, hopefully it will help you to see the whole uh, account um, uh, more clearly. So let me read it, and then I'm going to remind us of an important biblical truth, and then what I'd like to do is examine the text for us. There are three sections to this text. There's what uh, could be called the setting, there's what can be uh, seen as the teaching, what is it that Jesus taught, and then the third thing is the reaction. So let me read it. While, but while everyone was, on, was marveling at all that he, that is Jesus, was doing, and you'll see a little bit later in more detail, uh, that he'd been healed, he had just healed the son, of, uh, the epileptic son of a man. And while they began to go through Galilee, he, Jesus, did not want anyone to know about it. Then we come to the teaching. Jesus was teaching his disciples, and he said to them, Let these words sink into your ears. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he has been killed, he will rise three days later. And then the reaction. But they did not understand this statement. And it was concealed from them so that they would not perceive it, and they were deeply grieved. And they were afraid to ask him about this statement. If we're going to truly understand what's going on here, 
uh, we need to be reminded, I think, at least I'm going to take the opportunity to remind us of, the, of an important biblical truth. And that real truth is, why did Jesus come into this world? Why did he leave heaven and come to earth? Actually, his purpose in coming can be viewed and understood on, on differing levels. Uh, the first level, or one level at least, is stated in Paul's first letter to Timothy. And it's the one that is probably the one that we are most likely uh, to give us an answer to that question as to why did Jesus come. Uh, there Paul writes to Timothy, it is a trustworthy statement deserving full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, among whom I am foremost of all. Jesus came to save us. He came to save you if you're one of his. But there is also another level of purpose in which he came, and that's, uh, that we see in um, the Gospel of John. There John writes these words of Jesus. Jesus himself said this. He said, I am come that they, and he is speaking of his followers, of those whom he's come to save, that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. He said he came so that you not only could be saved, but that you could have life overflowing, abundantly overflowing. But there's yet a third level. And I believe that it's this third level that really these first two I've given you sort of flow from. They're one of the means in wit by which he accomplishes, I would say, the base purpose or the primary purpose for which he came into the world. We find that recorded in the first epistle of John. John writes there, the Son of God appeared for this purpose, to destroy the works of the devil. That's why he came. He came to fulfill the Old Testament promise that was given in Genesis 3.15, that there would be one who would be born of the seed of, uh, of Eve, the seed of woman, there would be one who would be born of the seed of woman who would crush the head of Satan. That's why Jesus came. These other things, vitally important, flow out of that. It's, one, it's the means by which he goes about crushing Satan's head. Just as the, just as the uh, second, uh, uh, I'm sorry, Jesus, this second Adam came to undo what the first Adam had done. He came, came to reclaim the creation that was rightfully his. He's already been doing that as we've been looking at his life and his you're familiar with so much more than we've been able to cover in this brief series. He's already been doing that. He's already been fighting. He's been involved with, in skirmish after skirmish with Satan, demonstrating who he is. Because in every skirmish, he defeats Satan. Just a few of them. Think of the wilderness temptations, an abject and very obvious defeat of Satan. But it's not the only place. We're told over and over again that he healed people's illnesses and maladies. We tend to think of that as his just, his just showing forth his kindness, his showing forth his love, uh, maybe his demonstrating his mercy, but it's far more than that. It does all those. But it's a battle against the effect of sin and the ravages of sin and the effect of Satan's control over this planet, over this world, and over all creation. He's in battle with Satan each time he does that. The scriptures make it clear oftentimes that he views these as battles of Satan because he addresses the demons that are causing the maladies in, the, in those whom he's healing. The young boy, the epileptic, who's just been healed, but one example. He demonstrated that he could, walk, that he could um, control nature. He turned water to wine. And then he later walked on water. He multiplied 
but a couple of fish and a couple of loaves of bread to feed 5,000 plus. He was the master of creation, the ruler of all creation. He calmed storms. And recently, in his life, he raised Lazarus from the dead. All of those represent victories over Satan. They're not just stories for us to teach our children and say, my, isn't this wonderful? They're not even just to demonstrate that he is God. They do that, but they are battles that have been won as he is exerting more and more, gradually, gradually exerting his influence in his victory over Satan. And we can't lose sight of that fact. Let me make one more application that's not in the biblical, uh, in the biblical record. But the fact that he reached into your life and that he changed your heart from a heart of stone to a heart of flesh and that he called you to be his and that he's adopted you into his family is one more battle with Satan that he's won. So it's not just a historical fact. It's not just something that we uh, see as an academic truth, but it becomes very personal when we realize that he has fought Satan and defeated Satan so that he could redeem you. Well, at this point in his life, he's fought all these battles and he's won them all. They all represent victories over Satan. But there's one last battle to be fought. One more victory to be won. One more stronghold to be destroyed. And that's death itself. And Jesus knew that. And so in order to prepare his disciples, his apostles, for this final battle, what he's done is he's pulled back in his ministry, he's pulled back in his public ministry, he's pulled back in his public exposure so that he can focus his time and his energy on those 12 men. If you read commentaries or you talk to theologians, they'll sometimes refer to this as uh, uh, the ministry of retirement. Jesus wasn't retired in that he stopped working. He was retired in that he had withdrawn from his public ministry and was focused on this private ministry to men. Some, sometimes it's called the ministry of withdrawal. And during this time, which we've really skipped over, most of it has occurred as they have been in Galilee. And so as we pick up this narrative this morning, they're headed to the town of Capernaum. It's a town on the Sea of Galilee, and that's where they're headed. And on the way, Jesus is begged by a father who's following them to please heal his demon-possessed son. We would describe him and uh, medically call him a, a, an epileptic. He was thrown into epileptic fix, uh, fits over and over. And so Jesus cast out the demon. By the way, in this case, he orders that demon to never come back and inhabit the boy again. And then gives the boy back to his father. And Luke tells us everyone was marveling at what he was doing. Who wouldn't marvel at that? Yet, though he had acceded to the father's request, he had entered into this one up more skirmish with Satan and with his minions. Jesus is not seeking public attention. He's not seeking acclaim or recognition. In fact, it's Mark who tells us he did not want anyone to know about it. Now, the truth of the matter for you and me is most times when we don't want, when we don't want anyone to know about something that we've done, Oftentimes, that's motivated by shame on our part, isn't it? We don't want people to know how bad we are. So we don't want them to know what we've done. Or sometimes if we've done something good, we don't want them to know what we've done because of our, our fear of becoming big-headed about it, of becoming proud and vain. 
Jesus didn't want anybody to know about it because he wanted to devote his time to teaching the disciples. And that's what he was doing here. He was trying to keep a low profile so he could have this uninterrupted time. Think of what he was doing with his disciples as a sort of a, a traveling outdoor seminar. It was an ongoing lesson that he was teaching them as they traveled throughout the region of Galilee. Sometimes performing miracles and sometimes Jesus just teaching. And so it comes to a time for his teaching. He wants to teach the disciples something. Now, the subject he's about to bring up, he's already broached it once, once with his disciples. And if you look at it, you, find, you can find it in Matthew 16. Don't turn there now, uh, but this afternoon you may want to go back and read it. That time when he broached the subject, it was not received very well. In fact, it led to a confrontation. You recall, perhaps, that Jesus had just commended Peter. Because Peter, when asked who Jesus was, he said, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. But then Peter needs to be addressed as Satan. Jesus says to him, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind at God's interests, but on man's. You see, neither Peter, with all of the wisdom, all of the insight, uh, all of the, all of the uh, perception that he, saw, that he showed from time to time, Peter along with the rest of the disciples, did not understand that Jesus had to die. That's not what they were looking for. It's not what they were expecting. And so now, Jesus raises that same subject a second time with, his, with the same group of people. Luke introduces it to us by writing these words, that Jesus said, let these words sink into your ears. It could perhaps be translated verily, verily, or truly, truly. We're familiar with those phrases. What, they, what the words actually mean is pay close attention. Or listen carefully. Or it may mean store this up in your memory. Or roll it over in your mind and meditate on it and think about it. Or it could mean take it to heart. It appears the disciples did exactly what Jesus had told them. Because all three of these men, as they write these, their gospel uh, accounts, each and every one of them use virtually exact same words to tell us what Jesus said. Jesus said, the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. The second time, Jesus introduces two new ideas that were not there in the first one. The first time he spoke of this, he, was, he emphasizes that it must happen. The Son of Man must die. This time, he introduces these two other things. His focus is not on the must, but instead it is on the certainty. The Son of Man is going to be delivered. No question about it. It will happen. Something new. It's like Jesus is, is, is homing in. He said, I've said this to you once, and you guys didn't understand it. You rejected it. You told me you didn't think it, you, you, you didn't think it should happen. But I'm telling you it will. There's no question about it. So get used to the idea. It is going to happen. I am going to be delivered into the hands of men. But this time he introduces the idea of betrayal in these same words that I've just read to you. Up until now he's only thought it was necessary to die, but now he says I'm going to die, but I'm going to be delivered into the hands of men. Think about that statement for a moment. The Son of Man. That's obviously a reference to deity. It, you, you can trace that term clear back to Daniel. But the Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men. How ironic. 
the very one through whom this world was made. The very one through whom everything in this world was made. This very man who was the creator of man himself will be delivered into creation's hands. What a humiliation for the creator to be delivered to man, to become subject to his own creation. So who's responsible for this humiliation? Who is it that's doing the delivering? For centuries the church has taught that this was a reference to God delivering his son into the hands of man. And that may very well be true. I'm not saying the church has wrong, been wrong in teaching that. But for centuries that's been taught. But, but much more recently now, some have thought it is a reference to Judas and his act of betrayal. That he's the one who's being thought of here as, these, uh, as Jesus spoke and as the apostles write. That the focus is to be on Jesus' act of betrayal. One of the most frustra frustrating things for those of us who, pre who, who preach weekly and who have sermons to prepare and who spend time studying the text and trying to understand what it is that something is saying is when you go to the original languages, whether it's Hebrew or, whether, or Greek, when you go to those languages and you find that going to the languages of absolutely no help in determining what the text is saying. Because the original text itself is ambiguous. It can be understood in a couple of different ways, and that's exactly what we have here. The text is ambiguous. I want to suggest to you that that's intentional on God's part. You need to remember that the writers did not just choose their own words. But they were inspired and led by God to choose the words that they choose. So if there's ambiguity in the text, it's because God wanted there to be ambiguity. And it ought not to be a frustration to us. But we ought to be forced to ask ourselves the questions, why did God leave this ambiguous? Why didn't he say clearly to us what was going to happen? Who was, in this case, who was responsible for this humiliation? When I ask myself that question, here's the answer I come up with. You can judge whether you think it's valid or not. It's left ambiguous because the fact is God delivered Jesus into the hands of man through the act of Judas. It's not an either or. Judas acting out of his own desire with apparently little regard for what God even wanted, for what the will of God was, delivers Jesus into the hands of men. What we see here, and the reason it's left ambiguous, is we see God accomplishing his will through the free agency and will of man. Let me say that again, because sometimes we, we see those things as being uh, as though they stand at opposite ends of a continuum, or as though they're in conflict with one another. But what we see here in actuality, in practice, what we see happening is God accomplishing his will through the free will, and in Judas' case, even we might say even the sinful free will of man. So who's delivering Jesus into the hands of men? Both. God and Judas. Second thing here, into whose hands was Jesus being delivered? Well, if you go back to Matthew 16, you find that 
he was being delivered into those who, who Matthew says, those whom under Jesus will suffer many things are none other than the elders and the chief priests and the scribes. The very men, the elders, the chief priests and the scribes, the religious leaders, the ones who should have been the first to recognize Jesus as the Messiah and to welcome him instead will kill him. That's what it mean, meant to be delivered into their hands. They would kill him. They'll not do it directly. They'll use Pontius Pilate and they'll use the Roman soldiers to accomplish it. Kind of reminiscent of the way David killed Uriah, Bathsheba's husband. He didn't kill him directly. He used the enemies to kill him. He just told his, his, his general, put uh, Uriah in a place where he's exposed and then withdraw all support so that the enemy is certainly able to kill him. So the scribes and the Pharisees and the chief priests and the elders, they didn't have either the authority and they may not have had the gumption either to kill Jesus directly. That we don't know. But they certainly didn't have the authority. So they used Pontius Pilate. They used the Roman soldiers. Nevertheless, Jesus says they are the ones who are responsible and accountable for his being killed. And when you read, the, when you read this account in Mark, what you find is that this idea of him being killed is... He, Mark, Mark mentions it twice. He says a second time that when he has been killed, then something's going to happen. He may have been emphasizing the point that he was truly dead. He may have been emphasizing the point that he was murdered. We don't know for sure what was in his mind. He may have been wanting to make both points, but here's what we do know. We know that Jesus was dead. And that's an important point that, that the church found essential to defend in the, uh, in the early centuries. In the second century, there arose a heresy called docetism. And docetism taught basically that Jesus only appeared to have a body. He didn't really have a body. He just appeared to have a body. And then again, in the, as, late as, as, as recent as the 18th century, um, as liberalism was coming on the scene, this thing appeared, this heresy appeared within the church called the swoon theory. You ever heard of the swoon theory? Oh, good. Because the swoon theory taught that Jesus didn't really die. He just passed out on the cross. He just, he just swooned. And they put him in the tomb, and he, he, he regained his strength, and he got up and he walked away. And so the text, and even the double emphasis that, Ma that Mark places on it, is important us to understand that Jesus was indeed dead. He didn't just appear to die. He didn't just faint. He died. Then we come to another kind of ambiguity. Matthew and Mark both tell us that Jesus said that on the third day or after three days that he would be raised from the dead or he will rise from the dead. They use, they use different phrases. Matthew says he will be raised. Mark says he will rise. Well, because of the, they, because of the difference in those, a, a debate has arisen within the church um, centuries ago as to whether, is it the father that raised Jesus or did Jesus raise himself? Some of you may have struggled with that from time to time as you've re just read the scripture. Did Jesus raise himself from the dead? Or did God the Father raise him from the dead? Well, the implication is if you're being raised, then you're, in, you're an inactive participant. Somebody's doing something to you. If Jesus will rise, the implication is certainly that he's instrumental. He's bringing it to pass. He's rising again. And it's worth noting, this is not the only place that we see this kind of, uh, I'm going to call it an ambiguity, but where we see uh, these two different perspectives portrayed in Scripture. And so whichever side of that you come down on, you can certainly, both parties can find other accounts in the Bible to support their 
own conclusion. Well, following along with the, theory, with the same way we handled that first ambiguity, it seems obvious to me that the correct understanding of this is that the Father and the Son worked in unison, that both parties of the Trinity were involved in this raising of Jesus. And so it's entirely correct to, cite, to say either one of them did it or to say that, that both of them did it. They were, act, they were both active in this resurrection of our Savior. Now, as we're looking at the life of Jesus, we need to remember, Jesus knows exactly what lies ahead. He's not the victim of circumstances. Nor was he simply the pathetic protagonist for whom things got out of control. You familiar with the uh, musical, I guess, I, I guess that's what we call it, Jesus Christ Superstar from, when, the 60s or the 70s? presents Jesus as just that pathetic protagonist. He just couldn't control things, and he got himself killed. That's not the case at all. Jesus knew for sure what lay ahead. He understands fully what will happen in Jerusalem, and yet he still goes there. I'd run the other way if it were me. But our Savior doesn't. He goes there, and he goes there to fight this final battle with Satan. This final, call it a skirmish, if you will, or call it, call it the conclusion. But he goes to fight this final battle with Satan. He goes to enter into Satan's final and Satan's last and probably Satan's strongest fortress. And on that cross, he, not, he pays the penalty for the sins of all his chosen brothers and sisters. But the cross is not the end. The victory is not won in the cross. The penalty is paid in the cross. The victory is won in the resurrection. In the resurrection, the de uh, he deals Satan that final crushing blow. That is him stomping his heel upon the head of Satan. Because death itself is defeated. Death, as the hymn says, can no longer hold him. Up from the grave he arose, a mighty victor over his foes. And Jesus knows that's all coming. The war will soon be over. The victories will, will soon be won. What we today await is the completion of that restoration of creation and that and 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 the the, the the execution of satan's punishment satan's been defeated his head's been crushed but he still even the scripture refers to him as he still goes about like a roaring lion a toothless roaring lion but one who seeks to intimidate until the day when his execution will actually be occurred uh, will actually occur will be executed But I want to leave you with one final thought. This is not just the final battle in which Satan is utterly and absolutely defeated. It is that. But it is also an act of tremendous love. An act of tremendous love. For in this action, Jesus demonstrates his love for you. You know how Jesus describes love at one, at, at, in uh, John records it for us. Jesus says there's no greater love than to lay down one's life for one's friends. We call it the ultimate sacrifice. Jesus says it's an act of love. What an act of love for his friends, his brothers, and his sisters. Many of whom, by the way, are still unborn. Still unborn at the G time Jesus laid down his life. Still unborn yet today. But Jesus laid down his life for them. What an act of love for his disciples who did not understand 
who were deeply grieved by all of this, and on top of that, were afraid to ask him anything about it. I don't know about you, I feel for those disciples from t sometimes. I feel for them in their ignorance, in their lack of understanding. And then I remind myself that they are all living on the other side of the cross. They're all living on the other side of these events. We have the benefit of knowing what happened. But not only an act of love for his disciples, but an act of love for you. And an act of love for me. For while you were yet a sinner, while I was yet a sinner, Christ died on my behalf and on your behalf. And brothers and sisters, that's the essence of the gospel. That Jesus, with full knowledge of the cost, proceeds to Jerusalem to, at least metaphorically speaking, put the last nail in Satan's coffin, but literally speaking, to provide salvation for each of us who were his enemies. Enemies whom he chose. Let me say that again. Enemies whom he chose to make his friend. Next week, the climax of this world-changing battle begins. Next week, Jesus institutes the final events, or not institutes, he initiates the final events of his and his father's plan as he publicly enters into the city of Jerusalem. We call it his triumphal entry, and it was. But oh, the cost of that triumph. That's what we'll come back to next week. Please pray with me. Jesus, what you have done for us is really incomprehensible. It's unfathomable. Why in the world you would choose the path that you chose. We simply don't understand why you would choose each one of us to turn us into your friend. We do not know. Lord, we understand it has nothing to do with our value or our worth as an individual. It's not anything we've done. It's not something we can bring to you. It's not something we will ever do for you that motivated you. It's simply your love for us, and we do not understand why in the world you would love us so. But Lord Jesus, we're so thankful that you do. We're so thankful that you have laid down your life for me and made me your friend. May that thought echo in our minds through the coming days and weeks and months and years until you take us home to be with you in glory forever. Amen. Turn with me, please, if you will, to hymn number 263, Lift High the Cross of Jesus.
Class will begin, I forgot that clock, uh, class will begin in uh, about 15 minutes, 11 o'clock here in uh, this room for adults and in the various classrooms for the children. Receive now God's benediction. Now to him who is able to keep you from falling, <coughs> to him who is able to pre prevent, uh, present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only wise God our Savior be glory, majesty, power, and authority, both now and forevermore, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.